Welcome to Here's What We Know, the podcast of unexpected conversations. And the reason we came up with that tagline is because of this guy right here from Thompson Square. It's Keeper, <laughs> Keeper Thompson. <laughs> Years ago, we had, we had, you know, you know, this is like, I don't know, we're closing in on 200 episodes. And you were like one of the first 30. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. And I've always meant to get you and Shauna back on. Now, Shauna's not here today because you have a kid. You have a kid. And things come up. Yeah, we got we got a kid. Yeah, he he uh I don't know where he got this grill situation, but he uh he's got an expander in his mouth and man, I'm gonna have ten grand of this kid's teeth before he uh before he turns nine, I think. I mean, just crazy. So we're getting the second opinion because the orthodontist that we were going to, they're like, someone's like, oh, you don't want to go over there, man. They'll just try to like screw you on, you know, pulling teeth that don't need pull. I was like, oh, that's good to know. So now we're, yeah. So we're, uh, we're, we're, we're doctor shopping yeah, today. You, so she you, had to go pull him out of school. When you go through that, like my, my youngest just broke his collarbone, right? And we, uh, we had the x ray taken and you had to show the pediatrician. And he looks at it, he looks at the x ray and he does this. He looks and he gives us a thumbs up and goes, Yeah. And I'm like, Not the reaction you expect for a broken ball. And right. I'm like, So what does that mean? He goes, It's a complete, clean, little, small break. He goes, it'll heal up its own, on its own by itself. And I said, really? He goes, and he showed me a, uh, uh, an x-ray of another kid. He goes, I saw this kid two days ago. And it was like, it, it, it looked like an A-frame, right? And he goes, this will heal on its own. At this age, they're built to do that. And my wife had already made a, a, right. uh, an appointment with an orthopedic surgeon. And he looks at him and he goes, listen, you understand that the way orthopedic surgeons make their money is to do surgery. They're never going to tell you no yeah. surgery is not needed. You know? Right. That's true, man. You have to be a consumerist these that these days. Well, I don't I don't trust anybody, man. That's why you and I are friends. I don't I don't even trust I don't even trust Shauna. I, I, I trust no <laughs> that's one. Why I, that's what I've always loved about you, man. Because you are I've always said if you could spend 20 minutes talking to anybody, you should try to throw 20 minutes toward Key for Tops because he <laughs> he will make you think whether you agree or disagree with him. He will make you think. And I think that's one of the coolest things you can say about anybody. Well, I, I, I appreciate that, man. I, I think the older that I get, uh, <laughs> not necessarily more opinionated I get, but I, I like to think that I'm more informed uh, than I was before. And, and with the landscape of, uh, of our country, the way it's in right now, I, I have less and less give a crap. So, uh, you know, I feel like everyone's got to speak their mind if they've, you know, Everyone has the right to speak their mind, you know, and it, it seems like it's only uh, kind of one sided these days and who gets to do that. But, uh, yeah, I just don't. Well, care and that's the thing <laughs> I find out is my thing is the agenda. Right. And 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 everybody has an agenda, especially news and the way they report it. They report it with their agenda yeah. going. Uh, and, and, right. and that's what I tried to teach to my sons. Like I said, I have an 11 and a 13 year old and I'm like, the biggest thing I've ever tried to teach since they were small kids was just pay attention. If I can get you to look around while you're walking, yeah. right? So you don't walk into things. If I can just get you to pay attention. And then as we grow older, what you're paying attention to should grow. It should become a bigger and bigger deal. You should be able to see more and more things if you pay more and more attention. And they've kind of started getting on. It's like, as we record this, the uh, the, 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 the uh, Hamas-Israel situation is still in effect. Well, the moment they started calling hostages detainees, that's an agenda. You're, you're trying, you know, you're Dude. trying to paint something to go along with your side and, and both sides do it. Let's be clear, I'm not, I'm not picking on what just one side. Both sides do it. It's the agenda that drives me crazy. Well, I, it, it it does, man. And they tell you the sky's red, and and no, it's blue. No, it's red, and and they believe that it's red. And even when they figure out it's not red, they still have to say it's red because they they've went down that path. And uh, the other side, they think it's blue. So I gotta say it's red. And it's like, man, it's it's, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. Uh, my daddy's 87. He's never seen. It's not just division. 
It's just a lack of common sense. And it's, it's literally like everyone's expecting us to all be insane and, and not have a mind or not have uh, just just common sense, you know. And, you know, I think the, the, the worst part about what's going on right now is nobody can admit when they're wrong, you know, and it's on a grand scale now. It's not even a personal thing. It's like it's a grand scale. It's this massive group and this massive group, and no one can admit that they're wrong. So they just double down on the ignorance. And I just, uh, I, I hate it, man. I, I hate where we're at. I, I hate, I hate it for my son. It scares me to death um, as a seven year old to see uh, what's going on right now, and, and you know, with with literally no end in sight to the stupidity. And uh, and that, that, it's not even insanity; it's stupidity. Now it's it's well, a past the point of like yeah, it's it's the stupidity. The other thing that gets you is, as you were saying, I love the thing about the red, sky is red, the sky is blue, and nobody wants to admit they're wrong. Is that not what we found out about post COVID? Isn't that the biggest thing that we found out is that everything we thought was yeah. wrong, and now they tacitly tell you it's wrong, but nobody comes out and goes. Yeah, we were wrong. As far as I know, the soldiers who got drummed out for not wanting to take the vaccine and the nurses and the doctors and stuff, people, they, they have yeah. been hired back because nobody wants to sit back and go, hey, you know what? Uh, and now we're getting this whole thing about, you know, oh, well, we didn't know what we didn't know. Well, no, we kind of did. We, we kind of did. But now we just found out that Stanford had this whole thing set up, Stanford University here where I'm at about their job was to create aspersions for people who disagree with what they thought. So this was back in, yeah. in the in the heart of it. So they already knew that, no, yeah. no, no, we're just going to quell all, all any, any disobedience to our cause. Like you were saying, nobody wants to say, hey, y'all, we were, we were wrong and we're going to learn. Right. Well, I, I, I have no doubt that they knew they were wrong when they were doing it, you know, and, and, uh, somebody knew, you know, somebody knew that, and, and it's not, I don't want to make a lot of COVID because I know a lot of people lost their lives and a lot, a lot of people got sick and I found out and, you guys uh, had it, stuff, right? I, was, I didn't know. I, I wow. had it twice. <clears throat> <laughs> I got it now. <laughs> uh, no, but it's like, you know, uh, that's the thing. It's like, when things are when 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 the when the truth comes out, everyone just kind of ignores it and doesn't report on it. Like, oh yeah, yeah, our bad, you know, sorry. Uh, but you know, it just I, I I don't know, man. I've never been a conspiracy theorist, but this sure as heck looks like something like test or something. I I, I don't know what what's happening, and and the fact that they're still pushing vaccines and you know get a free cheeseburger with the vaccine and. All this stuff. I mean, it's crazy. You know, I mean, I've never seen, uh, you know, a pharmaceutical company pushing the flu shot or 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 selling, selling like you would a brand. You know, sponsoring events. It's just gets nuts. And if you can't see, I don't care what side of the red of the, of the aisle you're on. If you can't see the red flag in that, you're just stupid. Well you know, I just, I just, uh, it's, it's, it's nuts. It's, it's, it's nuts. shocking to me how acquiescence, how acquiescent the public has become that instead of having a healthy dose of skepticism, skepti skepticism, yeah, is, is that, you know, as I've always said, I, uh, just to bring up Trump's name, I have no problem with the way the media tr covered Trump. My thing is, is I want you to cover every president that way. I'll sell out everything yeah. they say and don't believe one thing. And you you should always sit back and go, yeah, let's see if that's true or not. No, it, it, it's 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 nuts, man. You know, I I don't have any issue with Trump. You know, I don't care about mean tweets and stuff. I just I, I look at the grand condition. I, I try to and and uh, yeah. And the only thing anybody ever says is that they it, it's the things that they were fed on the news or whatever else. He's racist. He's this. And it's like verbatim. They just take the, 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 the jargon that they use and everyone applies it in this, in, in their daily life and their arguments against Trump or whatever. And I'm just going, you, you guys, if, if you look at the four years that we, that we had that guy and you look at the 30 seconds that we had this guy, and if you can't distinguish what was better, 
then then you think the sky's red. You know, I, I don't, you know, is, is Trump my favorite guy I've ever met? I mean, probably not, you know. I mean, but, you know, he's... Um, I, I looked at it like this when I was trying to decide on who to vote for and, and who to support. You know, I looked at this. I, I, I don't trust politicians. And any, anybody who trusts this politician, is, they're, they're insane. But because they're all self-serving and they're all, you know, they're you know worth hundreds of millions of dollars and they get paid 60 grand a year. You know, so there's some stuff going on there. So I don't trust any of them. I don't like politics. I never have been really heavily involved in politics. But when I look at, you know, Washington as as a whole. And I was like, why are they trying to annihilate this man before he ever gets in office? What's what is the difference here? There's something that's not like the other. And, uh, you know, he ran on certain things and probably one of the most one of the one of the only presidents I've ever known in my life to actually whether you liked it or not, he actually did what he said he's going to do. And I think that's why, you know, his followers are, are so strong and is so hell bent on getting him back in office um, because he did act on those promises. And when I see everybody trying to get rid of this guy and they've and the guy's not even in office and they're still trying to get rid of him. I'm like, they're trying to get rid of him. That's probably my guy. That's that's the guy that you probably want to look at as far as the. The, the the you know the the best but the best thing we can have for our country uh, uh you know it's not i mean everyone's done crazy stuff they've all the clintons i mean my gosh you can write novels and novels about the illegal stuff that they were involved in and it, but no one cares about that you know i mean joe can't spell his name you know he spells it without an e well, you know and it's it's like no one talks about it if trump acted like that when he was in office they would have impeached him in the first well, day. They, they tried to say you he know, had mental problems they, anyway. They really they, they really did it. They tried to sit back yeah. and go there. Here's my thing. I think America has a rich history of not, not trusting the elites because the elites basically try to rule by saying we're smarter than you and if you just knew more and 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 you know it's like it's like again i'll go back because obama but obama said this he goes well, we don't have a problem we just need to, we have a packaging problem if we just explained it to where these morons could understand it then you would you would follow what we say but if you look back on that america is littered with andrew jackson Andrew Jackson was a complete up yours to the elite, right? I mean, you couldn't be right. more of the people than Andrew Jackson. Uh, you know, right. Theodore Roosevelt had that same appeal, even though he was of Eastern elite, you know, background. Uh, Harry Truman, same thing. You know, if you want to go, Jimmy Carter was still that kind of thing where we don't trust the ones you're pushing on us. We, you know, it's 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 that. It not tries it, you know. So America, this is when people sit back and go, "Well, this is never." No, it has. It's happened all the time. When you sit back and tell us, "No, right. no, no," if we were just smart, we would vote the way you want us to. Who would not be pissed right. off by that? And if you wouldn't be pissed off by that, then maybe you aren't smart. Well, man, you know, we travel the country, as you know, and you know, during during the uh, during this uh, this last election with with. <clears throat> <laughs> Trump and Joe. I mean, everywhere we went, and I don't mean there's no exception. Everywhere we went, every state we went, it was Trump signs in the yards. People painted their damn houses with Trump's face on it. They styled their dog's hair like Trump. I mean, it was this country was. I've never seen the support for a president or an election like I did with with President Trump. Never saw it. We had a place in Orange Beach down there, thousands of boats uh, down there pro-Trump. Not a Biden sign, and I swear to you, I didn't see one Biden sign in any yard, not one Biden bumper stick. I mean, nothing. And, you know, if you just, and you look at that and you go, okay, this guy's, you know, he has arenas full of people at his rallies, and Joe's got five, and three of them had to be there. And it's, and then you go, how does a man lose an election like that? I just, 
it don't add up to me. I mean, the sky is still blue in my book. And I just, and, and again, man, you, if you don't have to like him. I, I'm not saying, you know, I'm, I'm a conservative. I don't care. If he, I mean, yeah. I don't care. Uh, I'm a conservative Christian, straight guy, married. I'm the worst of the worst. I mean, I'm the worst kind of human being you could pot And I'm white. God forbid. Uh, I, I wish I wasn't, you know. Uh, but, you know, but, it, you know, it's just, it, and it's made all of us, um, it's made all of us jump on the defense, you know. And, and I mean, it's torn families apart and friends apart. And it's, and it's ripping the country to shreds. And, you know, the uh, the 1% of our population is, is, is getting all the say. And uh, the rest of us are just to hell with us, you know, and, and uh, that would come to a, I believe that that would come to a head at some point, you know, and, and, uh, and we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens then. But history kind of tells you, um, you know, you push a, you push him, you push a dog too far back in the corner and, and at some point he's going to bite back. And, and uh, I don't know what's going to happen, man. I, I, I try to stay out of it. I don't watch the news. I, I don't trust any of the news. You know, but uh, we're just trying to live our life and and and, and do our thing, and and uh, I just feel like God's in control no matter what. So I, if I didn't believe that, <clears throat> I'd be in the corner right now, just shaking back and forth, you know, and and uh, curled up in a ball, which is kind of what I was during COVID. <laughs> hey, you know, man, well, but, you know, it, it takes you that I, way. I mean, and and I understand, like when you were saying, it makes you fear for your son. And I had this conversation with a guy because you know I'm an older dad. Right. I mean, so most it's like when my when I took my son in for his collarbone break and the nurse said. Are you his father? Because I'm like, I know you think I'm his granddad. No, but I'm his dad. Right. And yeah. I get that. And, you know, they always feel horrible. And they're like, and I'm like, no, no, I get it. But I had this conversation with a guy who's my age and he goes, my daughter has decided not to have children. And I said, why? He goes, well, why would you bring a child into this world? And I looked at him and I said, because he was a doctor, I said, hey, doc, why do you think the people back in 1100 thought about? Why would I bring a child into this world? How about people in 1919 right. when there was World War One? You know, I remember my parents, World War II. Hey, I remember growing up, you and I are the same age. Did you get under your desk because of a threat of a nuclear war? It, that's what we did. Right. And I said, so there's never been a, a free and easy time to be born. Ever. No. Right. And and that, and that's what I said. No. Right? God has a plan and 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 we're not so valuable that the world will end with us. Because we sit back and think, how can the world go on without us? Do they know who I am? They, they've got to be, they've got to stop after me. Well and it's it's the arrogance of, of us, you know. If if uh I do this all the time, man, it's kind of weird, but I, I I reflect on a lot of things. And I was driving the other day and just looking out across these fields and trees and, and everything else. And I was like, you know what? You know, at the end of the day, I mean, this is still a, a, a beautiful world that was created um, for us, you know. And if you just look at the Google, you know, Google Maps and you just zoom out, you know, and, and you see this little ball and you go, what is the arrogance of us at this point? juncture in society and in the timeline where we think there's people now that think everything else was wrong up to this point and we know everything how to fix it we need a one world economy we need a one world government we need this you know this doesn't work this doesn't work you know this these things have happened and worked for million we're, global warming Oh no, <laughs> dude! I, I I just don't I I don't understand because you have all these scientists that are saying this, and you just see a scientist go, "Hey, it's actually you know we we've, we've increased by point point zero 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 whatever else you know," and, and when we're so arrogant to think that we're gonna you know a destroy the earth, um, I think someone else is probably gonna do that before we get a chance to, but yeah, I you know I just. It's just crazy. The arrogance that we have right now is just it's just nuts and the and the stuff that we're forced to 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 uh to assimilate to is uh it's crazy, you know. And I you know, and I teach my son, he goes to I, I went to I went to all white school and uh 
there was no black people. There was no Mexican people. There was no, no, it was all, it was all crackers, man. I mean, it was, it was a big old bowl of Ritz. And, um, Cooper goes to school with a lot of different ethnicities, you know, and he's friends with all of them. And I've sat him down. And this is the problem, Gary. I, it, it, it's a parental problem. You know, it's a family problem. It's a God problem, in my opinion. But, you know, uh, I tell him, I say, hey, uh, oh, this is my friend so-and-so or so-and-so. And I'm like, I said, that's great, man. You know, I think that's great. I said, if you ever hear anybody say if, that you're better than them, you are not better than them because of the color of your skin. You guys are all the same thing. I said, you shouldn't hate them because of the color of their skin. So we teach our kid that. I said, there's two kinds of people. There's good people and there's bad people. It doesn't matter what color they are. Most of the people that I dislike are as white as, as, white as snow. You know, I, I, you know, I can't stand a lot of white people. But that's who I hang out with. You know, as, as a white dude, I mean, chances are I have more interactions with a bunch of white people than I do anything else. And I think, you know, most black people interact with, with more black people than they do white people. You know, and I saw a thing on Instagram the other day that I thought was beautiful. Uh, there's a little black boy and a little black, a little white boy. And uh, they both shaved their heads. Uh, so they wanted to trick their teacher into being able to tell them apart. And I was just like, man, can we not learn a lesson from these children? I mean, we need to act like children. You know, it, it used to be, don't, you know, that used to be a bad thing. But man, I tell you what, if we acted more like kids, everything would you be okay. You have to be taught how to hate. You, you know? have to be taught, you know, and, and yeah, it does, kids it don't think that way. Nobody ever thinks that way. And that's, that's one of the reasons yeah. I'm being blunt about it. One of the reasons I left Alabama is because I grew up in the midst of racism. You know, and I and I sit back and tell right. people, you know, when when you try to say there's systemic racism right now, it makes me angry for the people who truly suffered racism that most most kids oh, under 30. I don't care what ethnicity you're in, have never experienced. I've seen it and I had to leave no. it. And I saw I, I had uncles who were Ku Klux Klan members and, and I just I couldn't I could right. not take it. And I love one of the things I've been out in California forever is I love how truly diverse everything is. I mean, you should see my son's basketball team. Right. You know, it's I mean, every right. every every is there. And those kids don't think anything right. of it. You know, they love, they yeah. play, they yeah. high five, they hug. And and I I tried to explain that to my kids. I'm like, we would never have had that. Opportunity. All of us would have felt this wall between us. There's no way we would have all sat and hugged after something, right? And especially at my age, yeah. you know, is that age. And I love the fact that I am my my neighbors. I, I'm not trying to stop coming by. I've got four different nationalities, and they're over at my house all the time. And you just don't even think about it, right? right. And that's if we could just get to where kids get to that where don't teach them to hate teach them we use the word judge right but and we use it as a pejorative but you should judge you should judge up is that person a good person is that person adding something to the society yeah you gotta yeah. size them up and, and that's okay now yours is not to judge for eternity but you do sit back and go you and i but listen there are guys that you and i don't hang around with because in our lives because we figured out they weren't good. They weren't good and they weren't adding into right. us. And, and I'm not, I am, I am not going to go down a good road with this guy. Right. And it, right. that's a right. complete and utter judgment. Yeah. We I mean, could you imagine what uh, two generations from now, if our, if the parents would, would, would tell their kids what I'm telling my kid, you know, you're not better than anybody else. You need to love everybody. You need to uh, you need to size them up. You need to judge them. Are they good for you? Or are they bad for you? Do they lift you up? Do they bring you down? Do they say you're they're better than you? Do they call you these names or whatever that their parents you know ha have taught them? And then you know two or three gener you know, it, you know it, it kills me to see the NFL and all these all these people with all these stickers that says end racism or whatever else. You can't end racism. Either people are racist and are bad, or they're not. And that is taught. And that's, if you look over the last hundred years, compared to how it was a hundred years ago, it's just about over. <laughs> I mean, compared to everyone has equal opportunity. Yeah. And I, and I love to see 
success stories for every for anybody. But I mean, it it you know, I see the I see these black speakers on Instagram and TikTok and stuff, and just screaming and hollering at at, at their own race about you know we got to stop playing the victim, you know. But it, it's not just it's not just uh, it's, it's not exclusive to any race of. I've been a I've been a victim of racism one time, but uh, it was weird, you know. But it didn't shape my life. I didn't walk out of that house and go, I hate all black people. I'm yeah. done. You know, and this woman was like, I hate all white people. And because it was my accountant, she and I were really good friends. And I walked in the house to get my taxes done and met her mom. If she would have had a knife, dude, it would have been right in my throat. And I was like, Angela, what's going on? She goes, oh, don't worry about her. She hates all white people. <laughs> <laughs> but man, that's the thing, though. I can't change that. You can't end that. That's taught. That's generational. And, you know, if we just quit being assholes all the time about all this stuff and, and start teaching our kids, you know, uh, that we're not better and, and stop pushing everyone's agenda on each other. You have to accept me for this. You have to believe this way. This is the normal thing. You're crazy for being conservative and normal. Just live yeah. your dang life and stay out of mind. And everything is going to work out. But man, I tell you what, it, if you don't believe how I believe, you are dead to me. And I, it, well, it's that's that's my it's nuts, man. Life, it's nuts. It's it's crazy was, world. It used to be when I was growing up, people used to say, hey, just let me live my life, you know, and you go live yours and just leave me alone. And and then it became the yeah. ancient mile thing. It turned into no, no, no. Not only must you let me live my life, you must approve of my life and you must celebrate me using the language I approve of. And it's like, I right. listen, unless you sleep with me, I don't care who you sleep with. I don't. If it's as long as it's on another adult and they're in, go. That is, that's when I sit back and go, I don't judge you. You go do that. That's, that's between you and in my opinion, the good Lord, but you and whatever. But I don't, I don't yeah, care, man. but by the same token, I don't want to be told that I have to send out a tweet to, to congratulate you on, I'm not, you know, and that's what I've seen people get chastised for not sending out tweets or putting it on their social medias. Oh, yeah. And it's like, you cannot not even not do anything now, you know? So you're right. That's, it's, that's, that's it's, exactly you can't, right. You can't be a part of this. Okay. Well, you... You have done the podcasting world, and you understand right now. I got to take a quick break. Please support our sponsors. We're going to come back because they allow us to do this spending time with Kiefer Thompson from Thompson Square. At Reed Animal Hospital, they treat your pet as if it was their own. Now, I'm a very satisfied customer. I can tell you they mean that. It's not a chain, it truly is about helping you and your pet enjoy life together. Dr. David Reed and his entire staff take the time to get to know you and your pet. I can tell you what I like. He's helped me better understand what my dog Luna needs and how I can take care of her more efficiently and kindly. Find them online at reedanimalhospital.com. Two locations, Saratoga and Campbell. Little secret from me to you, Dr. Reed actually gives you his cell number so he can answer your questions and concerns. They really are committed to you and your pet readanimalhospital.com So speaking of podcast when are you going to get back to it? I loved your podcast. I never had a chance to tell you I loved Man, your podcast. And I'll give you my favorite episodes and stuff than what happened if you want. Yeah, well I, I, I do need to do it again. You know, I I think every everybody during COVID started a podcast and, and I got my gear sitting right here next to me and I truly did love it. Um, and uh, I, I think I put out 14 episodes and then I got so focused on getting a new record deal and, and writing an album and and uh, all that stuff. I had to put that on the back burner. I had to put the comedy on the back burner and, uh, and do all those things. But uh, I, I, I am going to get back into it. You know, I, uh, I don't want to rely. My thing was uh, I, I'm, I'm weird. And I, I think who's going to want to come on this thing? Uh, how do I make it interesting? You know, you want the biggest guest you can or whatever else. But I kind of want to just do it myself so I don't have to rely on that, um, you know, all the time. But, uh, you know, I think I'm trying to overanalyze, you know, what I want to talk about, you know, coming out. 
uh, on this on this on this second round. But I, I do have some ideas for for other podcasts that are um, that hopefully will come out soon. But um, you know, it's it's just it's a lot of work. Preach it, brother. It's a lot of work to keep your guests up, and then you got you know I you know I'm I don't have a producer, so I live out in the country, so um, I I I I record everything, I edit it, I. Uh, you know, it's all in Pro Tools. I multi-track everything, and I—I I mean, I do the whole—I do it all. So it takes me about four or five hours to do an episode, and man, it's just hard. Uh, you take four or five hours times you know twenty for the year or whatever else, and it's just a lot of freaking time, you know. So I—I uh, I do want to get back to. It. I did really enjoy. I love talking, and uh, that's. I used to want to be a radio DJ so bad. And so it's my, that's, it's my, it's my radio DJ. I got my headphones on. I got the claps and the applause buttons and all that stuff, you know, and, and you uh, I, been, I really do. You would have been great it. at it. You wouldn't have wanted the pay cut, but you would have been great at it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's my thing is that, yeah, well, you know, the average length of a podcast, you know how many episodes? Seven. That's the average. Because after seven, people are like, it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of things. It's not all this kind of stuff. And the one thing about my side of the business, because you and I are kind of in the same business, but on my side of the business, that's what we're used to. It's just the grind. It's the next one. It's always the next right. break. It's always the next show. It's always the next week. It's always. And so uh, that fit right into my skill set. And what you need are people. Yeah. I have people. When you get ready to do this again, I can set you up with some people that will do it very cost effectively. And that way you don't have to do it. Your job right. becomes content, which is all you really should be doing. I mean, any time in your studio right. should be working on your music, right? That's what are your comedy. Right, right. This stuff should be something that you create the content and send it out to someone and they turn it around and push it out and do all that other stuff. But uh, because right. I enjoy it, I, I love podcasts that I don't have questions. Because if we can't have a conversation, it's not going to be, it's not going to happen, right? And that's right, what I love right. about, uh, you know, people like talking about it. But like you, I've known you for years. I, I, I wish we were better friends. If we lived near each other, we would be. Uh, but but I, I just enjoy <laughs> how you think and how you approach and how you're unapologetically you. And you and I are both the same way. I guarantee you we don't agree on a lot of things when it comes to politics and everything else. But I think right. we both respect each other because because they yeah. do. You do have that. This is who you are. And as I always say to somebody, if somebody's consistently like a, an old business partner of mine was, was an ass. He was an ass. And my wife goes, he's an ass. And I'm like, we've known him for 20 years. At some point, it stopped being a right. him problem. And now it's a you problem. Right, because you you need right. to, that's who he is, <laughs> and you need to just figure that out. <laughs> Pardon right. me again. I obviously had the COVID too, but uh, <laughs> but having the conversations that what I enjoyed about your podcast is uh, some of my favorites. I love the Jeffrey Steele podcast. I'm like, man, you need to call Jeffrey Steele up and tell him to come on my show because I love Jeffrey Steele and we could talk. And oh man, he. What what a great American that guy is, man. I mean, he loves this country, and he is he's a little more angry about it than I am, you know. But uh, and and I think that's my thing too is is I love thought provoking things. Uh, I want to talk to intelligent people who have, and, and you know what? If if I'm wrong, prove it to me. You know, if I have to think this way, tell me why, and convince me that I am wrong. And a lot of times. Uh, you know, even in my marriage, you know, I mean, I, I've learned a long time ago that, uh, trying to be right and making that the foremost thing that, it, that you, that you, that you hang your hat on is, is, is marital suicide. And it, it's, and it's just, it doesn't do anybody any good. And I see it all the time when people get proven wrong and instead of acknowledging that, they just shut, they just clam up and just run off, you know. And and I'm just not like that. I, I, you know, if you if you prove me wrong on something and it makes sense to me, I'm like, okay, I see. I I mean, I, I see you got a point there. You know, I mean, you're not going to convince me of certain things. I mean, you're not going to convince me to be a Buddhist uh, or, or 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 some, you know, my my core beliefs or whatever, but. Um, unless you can prove it, <laughs> you know, and, 
I, I don't know. It's, 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 and that, that's the kind of the stuff that I liked doing on the podcast. And, you know, one of my favorite episodes, um, we became really good friends with Jay Raymond. Yeah. He's a four star general for Space Force. And he, he came, so I had, they came out to the cabin and, uh, and I had Secret Service at the house two weeks prior to him showing up you know, going through all these country roads with these black SUVs. And I had a, a whole armed regimen on my front porch when he was here. And he brought Nick Haig, which was uh, an astronaut that just got back from the space station. And um, so I have all these secret, I have all these people in my cabin. We do a low country boil for him, you know, and and uh, show him some Southern hospitality. And, and you know, Jay was, uh, he wanted to have the conversation about Space Force because it's not a joke, and everyone made fun of it because, a, you know, it's it's Star Wars, it's 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 Star Trek. You know, Trump did this, so it's got to be bad if Trump had yeah. anything to do with it. And I can tell you firsthand that if you feel like Space Force is a joke and you hate it because whatever Trump or whatever, um, you are sadly, sadly mistaken. Because I have been uh, to Thule, Greenland where all of our uh, satellites and radar communicate um, with every satellite just about that comes through, that goes uh, through the atmosphere or above the atmosphere and um, exchanging information. They ran us through a mock missile launch. And, uh, you know, you got these 20-year-old kids with this old antiquated MS-DOS-looking computer and every five minutes, someone's launching a freaking rocket in this world. And no one knows this. No one knows how many times. We go to space yeah. constantly. We're, we're, we're firing stuff up all the time. And, you know, he's like, we have, I think it was 60 seconds. At the time that we realized that someone had fired a rocket, we have 60 seconds to determine, is it friend or foe? What's the trajectory, speed? Where is it going? What do we think the intentions are? And then communicate that to Boulder, Colorado, and then have a response. Do we need to shoot it down? A minute. You have 60 seconds to determine all this stuff. And these kids are sitting there staring at a screen 24 hours a day, seven days a week, monitoring that. They're monitoring uh, space junk, which now is uh, probably 30 or 40,000 pieces of space junk orbiting at 15,500 miles an hour. And that's not count. That's only the stuff yeah. that we can see, you know, all the little things, the nuts and bolts and everything else. When, you know, China, China shot up, shot down one of their satellites to prove that they could. And it created 5,000 pieces of space junk, you know? And so you have all these things going on and everyone's like, Oh, space forces. And I went, you know, Captain Kirk and, I'm like, no, man, you, you want this because if you knew what's up there and what's out there, uh, it was scary to death. I mean, we got to sit on some meetings and I was just like, I don't know if I want to <laughs> be in this meeting. I don't know if I want to know this, man. I mean, it's, but he is a great, great man. And, uh, and so it was weird having a, talking with an astronaut and a four star, a fifth generation four star general in, in our house. And uh, that was, that was by far my favorite podcast. I got to play them on my Gallagher machine. I beat both of them. I bet, I bet, a, I bet a spaceman and a, and a four-star at Gallagher, you know. Yeah, so. and, and at pool, okay, I Okay, you've got pool skills. We'll talk about that soon. But uh, I, I want to go on this. Isn't it amazing? I had a four-star general in studio with me once. And I told him, I said, you know, you are unicorns. There are so few of you. When you meet a four-star general, oh, it's yeah. a big darn deal. And an astronaut, I've met one, I think. Again, I've never met any of the guys who landed on the moon. That That's just a dream. You know, I, that would be, right. those guys are just completely different. And I'm a, a space guy. And and just to go, your, your point about, you know, you can make fun of it because it was President Trump. And I'm trying not to get too political. But do you know one of the things that... Uh, that Joe Biden didn't touch Space Force because everybody did agree this yeah. is something that's needed. This is something that you may not like the name, but that you like what they do. And I'm fascinated with space. And and that's the stuff that I, no, I, I am. I love every day something's coming out about the James Webb Space Telescope because we learn so right. much stuff. And the thing I love the most 
is the more we learn, the more wrong we found out we've been and how our science still yeah. is beyond the pale. I mean, you've seen the stuff about they found a galaxy that they first thought was 16 million years old, 16 billion years old. And the problem is, is they think the universe is 13 billion years old, 13.8 billion. Right. Then they they brought the, they said, okay, let's redo the math. Okay, the galaxy is only 13.6 billion years old, which is still, a, a galaxy can't form in 2 billion years. You know, the size of space is this. Well, now they just come out and said, no, it seems that the galaxy is really 23 billion years old. Right. I mean, they don't know, man. And the math doesn't work. And and when they sit back and 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 I find that fascinating. I find that as a man of faith. I'm a Christian also. I love the fact that we get to this certain stage and we're like, okay, now we think we know. And then we finally get far enough away, which a million miles in space is literally nothing. And a million miles out, we find out that everything we think is wrong. And everything that we thought... Another thing they found a they found a binary uh, star system, you know, where the bar, stars are circling around each other, and our solar system, the planets go around the equator of the sun, right? Well, they found a galaxy where you have these two stars rotating, and the planets are going north and south. The planets are going from the top to the bottom, and they didn't even think that wow. was possible. Right. Well, exactly. We know everything. That's my point. That's what I love about space is it's just like, and I've had this conversation, Cooper will get there because he's still a little young, but having to go with my kids and, and my son's like, what does quantum physics mean? And I said, A, I'm not smart enough to tell you, but B, here's what I know. Quantum physics is when all of the laws that exist in the macro universe, when you turn it around and go small, all of those laws no longer apply and we don't know why. Well, and that's the thing. We're never going to know. I mean, because we're, like you said, we're, 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 the more, the more we learn, the less we know. And that's, and that's evolution, you know? And I, I think that's, I think that's kind of a cool thing. I mean, we are making attempts. I mean, we do know certain things, you know, but, uh, I love some of these comedians that talk about, uh, there was a, agnostic guy talking the other day and he was like making fun of the fact that I'm going to mess it up. But I was like, you know, so, so we believe in God, we believe in a create creator, you know, we pray to this creator. We do this, you know, you know, we go to him in prayer. We, you know, we put things in his hands, you know? And then he was like, I don't, I just don't believe in a higher power. And then he was talking about, but here's my vision board. And then all, all of these things, it was like, so it, essentially, how he how he mapped the joke out was like it was God, it was a God or some sort of entity that was just like God, but it was it was everything that was anti God. But when you put all the things together, yeah, I mean, you, you have this my vision board that I look at and pray to every day, and and I, I you know I talk about this and I put it in the universe, and, I'm, and it was just kind of funny coming from an atheist. Uh, atheist agnostic uh per perspective and i didn't tell the joke very funny but i was dying man i was just like god come but it's yeah. common sense and i love it one thing i love about comedy is even if you don't agree or you're you're so self-absorbed in this competition that we have right now uh man they make so much common sense sometimes it's just, it's, it's just undeniable. You know, I just, I, it's, it's so funny. And I know you've got the comedy. I, I wanted to touch on who are some of the uh, comedy that, you know, I don't think you can be a hotter comedian than Nate Bergazzi right now. You know, uh, he is on fire. I thought I, you know, I've never met Nate. Um, and we, we, you know, I, I could, I, when I was playing a lot, I was down at Zany's a lot playing here in Nashville, which is a, uh, a primo uh one of the premier comedy clubs in the country and um i heard about him heard about him i do like nate i enjoy i i, I do enjoy his con i think it's very smart and uh but i i when he did snl i was like this is there's no way this is crazy and then he crushed it and all of his skits were fantastic and he just seemed like a really great guy i like i said I, i've never met him 
Um, but yeah, he's on fire right now. There's a couple guys <clears throat> on fire uh, right now. Uh, someone that uh, shoot, I can't think of his name right now, but he just he just got the sofa with uh, Leno or not Leno with uh, uh, Jimmy Fallon, um, some young comedian who he started out on TikTok. He put one one joke up and it had like thirty million streams or whatever, and he just exploded. Now he's selling out arenas everywhere. You know, uh, it's crazy. But you know, I I still think um, uh, Sean took me to see Dave Chappelle uh, for my that was my I believe my Christmas present last year. And I got to see him in Ohio, and uh, man, this dude sold out fourteen thousand tickets in three minutes. And I don't think there's a better comedian than than Dave Chappelle. I I think he's about as good as it gets as far as being balanced and 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 having common sense and making fun of both sides and all that stuff, you know. But you know, comedy's under fire. You know, I mean, you can't tell uh, certain jokes anymore without making everybody mad. And you know, that's the uh, that's the break. That's the straw, man, for me. Because it's you know, comedy needs to be untouched when it comes to uh, social in- inequalities and because the thing of it is man is we are all different white people do things that white people do black people do black things mexican people they do mexican we're up and and, and they they like oh that's a stereotype you're stereotyping yes because we're all a stereotype mm-hmm. that's what makes us special you guys want us to make us all the same you want us to all be beige yeah you know and you know, beige is boring, and and comedy is so great because it makes fun of all of us, you know. And uh, it's just you know, I I don't know, man. I you know, you go to you go to these shows, and every race makes fun of white people. Or we talk like this. I mean, I've never known anybody that talks as white as a as a black comedian portrays a white guy talking yeah. or walking. I don't. <laughs> I mean, I don't understand that. Like trying to keep something between them. You're walking with something between your butt cheeks to keep, you know, it's crazy. Um, but if you flip it around, that's a no, no, you mm-hmm. can't do that. And, uh, I do remember telling my first joke that had, uh, uh, that had some of those topics in it. And I was nervous, man. I was nervous. I walked out and, uh, I was like, well, because it was a funny joke, you know, and it was true. And that's the thing about comedy. If it's true, and everybody knows it's true, then it's funny, you know? And so I, I had I had my first day. Yeah, I walked out, man, the, and the audience was about, you know, three-fourths, well, probably 80% black. And I was like, oh, God, I don't know if I should do this. I don't know if I should do this. And I was like, you know what? I'm doing it. And I did it, and that place exploded with laughter. And I got approached after the show by so many wonderful people Say, man, that was uh, such a funny joke. It's so true, you know. And I was just like, thank you, because I was just, we gotta, we gotta be able to poke fun at each other, you know what I mean? To 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 have a good time, and that's all I was doing. And and it wasn't anything bad, or or you know, it wasn't bad at all. It was just true. Well, you know, it was and the funny. pushback, the and, pushback, uh, Cubs. I mean, the Chappelles are out there. I I think you know, and you said right, Dave Chappelle skewers both sides. I think Bill Burr does a good job of, skew- of skewing both sides. Uh, and, and yeah, and, and that's the and those guys because you're you know those are the ones who are selling out arenas, right? And I mean, and I yeah. blame the late night talk shows because then it became just about trying to get the audience to clap along with your opinion instead of actually making you laugh. And and, uh, and the when, when it gets back to the laughter and and people being able to poke fun at each other, and we will get there. You start seeing you're seeing the pushback now. You're seeing a uh, the, oh, it's the turning, lot of the man. younger generations, of it. you know, you know who's stopping, who's not, the, the numbers are going down on uh, social media use, 15 and under, because they see, they see where it leads, right? And so wow. you're seeing, you're seeing uh, teenage pregnancies are going down, kids having sex before 18 is going down, all those numbers are going down, uh, because these kids are tremendously smart, they're growing up with more information than you and I ever hope to have, and, uh, and no, you're you're 100 percent right. I I I I have faith in the future. I do, um, because I think the the these 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 younger kids are smelling the BS. They're they're starting to get a sense of what they missed 
uh, pre this generation or the last generation, <clears throat> you know, they're, they're, they're starting to hear country music again. You know, they go, wait a minute. Oh, it's still, what is it? Steel guitar and fiddle? Oh, is it a story song? Oh, this song made me cry. What is this? <laughs> and so that's why you're seeing a, a, you know, a little bit of pushback or a, you know, resurgence in that. Even if something simple as buying vinyl, you know, uh, you know, vinyl sales are, 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 have increased. And so it's just, they are, I think they're, they're, they're digging for information instead of just allowing themselves to be force fed with it. Yeah, you know what I mean? absolutely. And that's, I, I watch my own kids because we've been going to, well, we go to a Christian middle school and we're getting ready to go to a high school. Right. And we're trying to figure out the high school and what aligns right. with our values and this and that and stuff. And my 13 year old, you know, here's the moment that just melts your heart. He looks at me and he goes, Hey dad, you need to know that I know who I am. I know who I am. And, and I'm like, good, because now that means we've done our job, it's you know, that we've helped you to figure out who it is. And the stuff that they, the stuff he finds funny, the stuff that, you know, and that's the joy. Your kid is starting to get there when they start figuring out what makes you laugh and they start making you laugh. Right. That's when parenting enters that really sweet spot. My kids will do that to me all the oh, time. I know, man. I'm with Mike and Brenda Council with another real Mike Council plumbing and rooter story. And let's let's talk about the early days. What was it like? Well, when we first started, you know, the phone was by the bed. So just the two of you. Exactly. And I would answer the emergency She'd calls answer. in the middle of the night. I'd wake up and answer them. Two o'clock, I'm headed out the mm. door. So 30 years ago. 30 years and six months. But I hear Mike Council plumbing might have had its beginnings when you were, <laughs> what, a kid? Yeah, I grew up in a little one-room shack and we had an outhouse out back. An outhouse? That's correct. Oh, my. And, um. Ended up with a great appreciation for indoor plumbing. Yeah, I guess. And when you when you finally got it? It was a great day. Since 1993, the people of San Jose and the South Bay have trusted Mike Council Plumbing and Rooter for all their plumbing needs. From emergencies like a drain backup or water leak, maybe you need a new water heater or fixture installed, a gas appliance hooked up. Give Mike Council a call at 408-217-1002 or go to mcplumbing.com, an official partner of the San Jose Sharks. You're in clean hands with Mike Council Plumbing and Rooter. And we were talking comedy, and we're talking about how, how cool it is. And we talked about some of the comedians, and Nate, and Nate Bergazzi and Bill Burr, Dave Chappelle. Uh, I tell you some others I love. I just had Greg Warren on. And uh, Greg is hilarious to me, but it was very interesting. When he came on, you never know when you do a podcast with comedians. You never know if they're going to be funny right. or if they're not. And my thing is, I'm a big Greg Warren fan. And he came on, and first of all, he's completely changed his body. Right. He's lost like a lot of weight. I mean, he just looks fighting ready and he's in his 50s and he look, looks fighting ready. And uh, I started I was telling my wife, I'm like, here's where my brain goes. You're tired and you're hungry because you've been working out and you've not been eating. Right. And also you get right. tired of being funny all the time. And what it was great, I, I encourage everybody to go and listen to that episode because what he was was very reflective. And you know who's been really pushing his comedy career is Nate Bergazzi. Nate just produced his his uh, his uh, special on Netflix and, and uh, YouTube and everything else is, but he was very reflective of the process of comedy, and that was such a gift right. to hear how he. I go to a coffee shop. I sit down. I write. I don't care if I write good or bad, but I write. And how and how you know he was a right. high school and college wrestler. Right. And he goes, it's the same kind of attitude. You do your work, you do your running, you do your all the things, because that's when it gets you to the stage. Right. He goes, all the stuff that, you know, the, the way right. you win a wrestling match is you win it before you ever step on the on the on the mat. And he goes, I take the same attitude to com right. comedy. And I'm like, dude. Right. That's brilliant. It it is a lot about preparation. You know, I I I've never written a joke before, so I didn't know what I was doing when I started doing uh, comedy and uh, I wrote my first joke and it went over pretty good. And then, you know, we realized that, Hey, uh, uh, you're, you're a pro songwriter. So maybe you should lean into that. So, and that's what I did. I started, I started writing songs and, you know, when, but it's weird because I don't co I don't collaborate with anybody. I write everything myself. Uh, I've been, I've been actually writing with a guy named Mark Gross in LA. He's a <clears throat> CBS sitcom writer. He wrote yeah, Mike and I know Molly. Who Mark and Gross did. He's a big yeah. sitcom writer. And so he and I have become friends and, and he likes my comedy. And so we've, uh, we've been Zoom writing a little bit. I went to LA and wrote with him and, and, uh, hanging out and stuff. <clears throat> he's, uh, 
he, he's a ridiculously funny guy and and a great stand up comedian. He lived with Chappelle for years. I mean, he's uh, he's the real deal. And uh, but yeah, it's just you know, so I started writing comedy songs, you know. And so if I didn't have anything original, uh, I would take a, uh, a, a a song and and do a parody of it, uh, really for practice. Um, so I've you know I've got songs like um, you know Sam Hunt's got Body Like a Back Road. Well, I I had a really bad experience with a very large lady uh, on an airplane <clears throat> as that song was as that song was playing. So as as we were on the flight, I wrote "Body Like a Wide Load," and uh, you know it's like it's not offensive to fat people, whatever. But uh, it, it it's 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 pretty damn funny, man. You know, and I had a you know, I used to go to this YMCA over in Brentwood, and I noticed that there was always an ambulance that was sitting at the corner of the parking lot, and it was always <laughs> idling, and it was always there, just waiting for someone to die uh, on a treadmill, you know? So I wrote, um, I wrote a parody of YMCA called <laughs> die MCA. And, uh, that's, it's pretty good, but you know, he, uh, yeah, Mark, Mark, Mark told me, uh, he's like, well, he's not, he goes, I wrote a lot of stuff for Ronnie Carrington, you know? And, and, uh, he goes, but I like, I, I like your style. You're doing it. I, I, you need to do it. I said, what do you need from me? I said, I just need ideas, man. And, um, I, I he goes, I said, do you have any funny ideas or kind of off the wall stuff that you've heard, you know? He said, well, my grandpa, I think it was his grandpa, he said he was dying. And he was on his deathbed, and the whole family was there. And uh, I guess one of the kids, the cousin's uncle, some, uh, said, well, grandpa, what are you going to miss the most? You know, because it, it, was, it was time to go. But it was peaceful. It's the way you want to go. Surrounded by family, you know, just talking and loving on each other. And and he goes, uh, Grandpa, what are you going to miss the most when you, when you when you leave this world? And he goes, and they, he said he said this without even blinking. He goes, titties. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, dude, I love that man. And you just gave me a great <laughs> song title. So I wrote that song. I wrote like 16 versions of it before I finally got it. And uh, I played it for Mark. He's like, dude, he goes, you have three or four more of these. And we'll do a special. So, you know, so I'm working on that. But Shauna just, I mean, I did it the other night. And you have to do it in the right crowd. But uh, in our acoustic shows, I do some comedy stuff, you know. So I'm I'm doing comedy every week. It's just not on a, on a comedic stage or anything, you know. But uh, I'm always I'm always practicing stuff, you know. So, But, you know, if comedy does nothing else for me, except for make me more comfortable being who I am on the musical stage. Um, I'm satisfied with that. I mean, it's made me 20% better as far as just not caring. And uh, I mean, I've been on stage for years, you know, but you still have crowds that you can't grab. Uh, and, and it seems like comedy is always the, the one thing that, that will bring a crowd in if you're having a hard time with them, you know, and, and uh, especially the acoustic shows, you know, we do a lot of fun stuff for that, but... How's Shauna is a comedy audience. And I say this, I, I had Paul Reiser on, you know, Paul Reiser from Mad About You and, and you know, very famous comedian. And I said, because uh, he does a lot of jokes about his wife and, you know, and stuff. And I said, here's my thing. As, as, as a comedian, when I try to say something funny, if I say it, if it's just me and my wife, she's like, whatever. What are you talking about? Right? But if I say it around right. friends, my wife is the loudest laugh. She's the loudest laugh and everything like right. that, right? And he goes, we're the exact opposite. He goes, my wife laughs when it's just me and her. If I sit around friends, she's like, I can't believe you said that, you know? And I'm like, isn't that crazy? So you're the yeah. third and deciding type of vote, type of breaker here. How, how shall I as the, uh, yeah. as, the, as the audience for comedy? Well, you know, Shauna's a, Shauna's a really good writer. I mean, we, we, uh, she never, she never writes songs. What I hate about her is I've written a thousand songs and I have three big hits that I've written. She's written five songs and she has three big hits. You know, so I'm like, hey, you know, we're gonna give daddy some more credit. Uh, but as a as as a comedic audience, you know, when I started out, I put her. I went up my studio and I literally got a mic and I was like, hey, so hey, how you doing, guys? Good to see you. I had her on the soap and I was like, hey, what's going on? All right, my name is Keeper. You know, I'm from this band called. So I, I did the whole, you know, the spiel, and she was dying laughing. And I was like, all right, that's cool. And, and we were sitting around dinner one night, and, and I was 
Uh, you have to put on a comic yeah. hat. So like, if you're wanting to be funny, you got to really get into it. I mean, you got to, hey, hey, what's going on? You know, you got to, whether it's your true persona or not, you have to become the person that you want to be. And and so I was like, we were talking about something, you know, and uh, about race or whatever. I was like, you know what my least favorite race is? It's white people. And I don't know what it was about my timing with that joke, but she spit <laughs> her food out and was literally just, her and our manager was just dying laughing, you know? So it just, you know, I just want to have fun, but she's, she's good. Uh, she's good. I, I do have to, uh, I have to trump her every once in a while because um, she's not always right. You know, she's like, you can't, you can't write titties. You can't write. I mean, no one's going to, no one's going to like that. And I was, I'm going to send it to you when I get off here. So, but I, but I, so I did it. She's like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, so I start playing it for people and they're like, oh my gosh, where can I buy this? You know, where can I download it? You know? So I'm like, all right. So now over analytical Kiefer, uh, you know, I want to shoot a video for this. This is going to be a fun video to shoot. <coughs> but just how I want to kind of relaunch this is take a song, do the visual stuff for it, you know, make a little video for it, spend, you know, a thousand bucks or whatever, do do all the things, chop it up, put it out on TikTok. Do the next song and promote the songs, promote, kind of like we'd like yeah. we do in radio. Uh, but like put a song out, promote it for a few months, put another song out, promote it, <clears throat> and then see what the numbers do. And then if the numbers are there, go tour it. You know, go tour that. Because I don't have time to go out and play 200 comedy shows a year for <clears throat> for 50 yeah. bucks. I can't do it. You know, I just, I, I can't sacrifice Thompson yeah. Square for that. Um, and then uh, and then we got the Shauna Thompson Project coming out next year, it looks like. So we're going to have a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of irons in the fire next year, but I, I do miss it, but I, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. I'm a little bit scared to get back into it just because I'm starting all over again, you know. And I was doing, you know, 45 minutes. I had a solid 30, but I was doing 45 minutes to an hour. Um, I was featuring just about every show I did, and um, you know, we had like five nights at Jimmy Kimmel's in Vegas, and they were trying to get me on the Kimmel show because he likes to promote his comics for his for his or a venue and. All this stuff, you know, so, uh, and then COVID squashed all that, you know, so now I just got to start all over again, you know, and so I have to literally go back and relearn. Listen, having, having a, the bits, having what a 30 or 40 minutes set is impressive. Most, if you can usually do eight to 10 minutes, I mean, <laughs> David Spade has said he built a career on 10 minute sets. That, that, that's all he had was yeah. 10 minutes. And he goes, really, four of it was good. You know, six minutes was just attitude. Right. Right. But, but I've built a career on right. that. And I've always sat back and said, Man, if you can put together 30 minutes, because, you know, in radio, we just do improv comedy. It's improv comedy. You do it every day. Uh, and, and I've always, right. I love comedy. I love comedians. I do not know if I could sit down and write something funny. I really don't. I, I, I do a Substack column, and I try to write and have fun with it. But it's like, I've yet to try to write something that's just nonstop funny, because I tend to... I'm like you. I want to think about things. I want to try to get a truth out, right? And 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 and, right. and it's not political all the time. It's it's just anything. It's just the human condition. What is a truth? And uh, and and having that moment. But I would love to be in on a writing session. N not that even I participated. Yeah. I would just love to watch a comedy writing session. I think that'd be the best time. No. It, 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 you know, I, I told Mark the same thing. I said, can I sit in on a sitcom, right? You know, and he's like, yeah, man, we could totally set that up. So I don't want any credit. I don't want to write, but it, I want to see how that goes down. You know, and, uh, you know, it's just, I'll tell you. Grabbing, grabbing a guitar. So, so I was like, so with with that with that particular song we're talking about, you know, uh, it's just it was to me it was like it has to be verbatim what's going down. So I was like, is Grandpa laying down, his family crying, telling stories of the past. Somebody asked him what he'll miss the most from all of the good times he had. It wasn't his children and it wasn't his wife that he's gonna miss when he's gone. 
And all the damn things that that man could have said But Grandpa said he'll miss the most It's ten A's, you know So it, 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 it's just kind of a, the verbatim truth of, of kind of what was going on you can on. already hear the and people I, singing along, can't you? You can already hear it Oh my gosh, dude I, it, it goes, you know, white ones, brown ones, uh, lopsided weird ones, uh, black ones, tan ones, hell, even trans <laughs> ones. I don't discriminate. I mean, it's, it's all, so I had to go to just all the different words, uh, all of the different words for uh, mammary glands. Uh, there's a lot of those in there. And actually, Shauna, Shauna had the idea, she was, you need to put mammary glands in there. And I was like, mammary glands, <laughs> you know? So it's just funny. And I, I actually put a shirt together. I was going to donate all the money to breast cancer. It, was, it would have been a great time to do that. So I had a shirt that said titties on it. And on the back, it had all the different acronyms for for uh, or, or, or sub, sub categories or whatever for that. It was funny. Anyway, I couldn't get it hey, together fast still, enough. But I thought, that's oh, a time break. That's an evergreen idea. That'll, that'll be whenever you get around to doing it, it'll work. Right? It's it's not time yeah. sensitive. Uh, Just as breasts aren't time sensitive. Right. Right. They were they were here in the no. beginning, they'll be here at the end. It's something we can all <laughs> they are timeless. <laughs> all right, my friend. I'm going to let you go because you have been so wonderful with your time. And I love doing this and, and I find we I love I love when I when I asked Ty, uh, Keeper, I said, hey, will you come back on the podcast? He goes, yeah, we're really looking forward to it. And he sent me a text. He sent me a gif of a guy going, no, no, I'm not. So I sent him back <laughs> one going, yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I I I enjoy it, man. I'm glad you asked me to, to do it again. I think it's funny that after I sang that song, you wanted to wrap because it up. Because I'm not going to do better than that. <laughs> Like, oh, we gotta go. We gotta go. All because right, if hey. you don't end it, you know as well I as I do. It. When you have your mic drop, don't keep hanging out. When you, when you, I got you, man. You when you had the, note. when you when you had the song titties, there's no place else to go but from from there. Then go down. And what I want to do is this. this Can't is beat that. The episode to get you to the third episode. <laughs> because there you go. I will continue to ask. <clears throat> I try not to do it during the summer because yeah. that's when you guys are playing a lot. But I always try to find that right, downtime. Right. So when you get, because I know how hard it is. So I, I, I saw your podcast that you finally got Ty Herndon on. Ty and I talked for, I'm saying, three straight weeks. And he always found a reason not to. Right. That's Ty, yeah. though, man. I, I love him, but he's and hard to tie up. down. I gave he's up, and I'm like, ah. Oh. So the next time we talk, I still want to talk. I want you to get back to your podcast. I want you to do it again. I love to. I want to. I I have yet to listen to Lindsay L, and I want to listen to Lindsay because she is the complete polar opposite yeah. of you when it comes to politics and how she approaches life. And I can't wait because I also know you're right. very giving and accommodating. So I'm going to go listen to that podcast today. I am. I can't wait to hear it. Yeah. Thank you, man. You know, one of the weirdest ones I ever did is on the final note is, you know, when my mom passed away, I, I had a lot of, I, I'm still struggling with that, but uh, it was about three o'clock in the morning and, and uh, I'd written a song uh, with the guy that just lost his dad, Vicky McGee. And that was kind of the episode, man. I just kind of turned the mics on and I just sang the song as best I could get out of, get through it. And that was kind of the episode, but I just kind of had to get it out there, you know, and it was like, yeah, it was like three or four o'clock in the morning when I did that. And, and uh, my preacher called me. It was like, dude, my, my my preacher from when I was a kid, he called me. He's like, man, he had me just, I was literally bawling in my car listening to that, you know, because I could tell how hard it was for you to sing that song. And, you know, I was struggling getting through it, you know, but I I, I want to peel back the, the veil a little bit, let people know, see there, you know, because man, we're, I mean, we're, you know, country artists or whatever, but. Uh, we're still people with feelings and, and and problems and and all that stuff and loss and hurt and all that thing. You I know, think that's so, what people I know. gravitate that, that was, toward, right? I mean, I uh, I yeah. I think I have a real I, I have a reputation here in the San Jose Bay Area as the guy who probably cries the most on here, right? Uh, right. I remember when my brother-in-law who passed away, who I loved beyond beyond scope. Uh, and told him, you know, I was always up front with my audience and I'm like, I'm leaving. I'll be gone for a few days because, you know, Johnny, Johnny Lowry has died. And, you know, and this is all right. through tears. 
And uh, I said, you know, I said, uh, you try to sit back and play a song. And I'm going to play a song for him right now. And I can't tell you the name because I'm going to go cry. And it was He Walked on Water from, right. uh, from Randy Trapp. And yeah, it just yeah, yeah. tore yeah. me apart. And I walked out and even Julie couldn't talk to me because it was just like, just, I just, I, yeah. that's where I'm at. Yeah. And, and being able to show, yeah. I remember trying to wish my son happy birthday and he was just old enough to realize it was dad talking. Right. So he's probably on five or six and I just broke down and just, oh, you know, how much, yeah. how much they mean to you. And it's the first time that they are, you're oh, able yeah. to tell them and they can hear and understand it. Uh, and I think people have responded right. to that because they do. That's what I was talking about writing the truth while ago. And we talked about comedy and we talked about your music. And, and the beautiful thing about Grandpa's Titty song is that it still rings with the truth because there's that guy who's enjoyed right. life and he was there to make his family laugh. How giving is that? that, that was he it. was like, I'm going to give you oh, one it's, last it's laugh before selfless. I go. It's, it's it was selfless. He took he took the elephant right out of the room, and I just thought that was I thought that was a beautiful uh, a beautiful thing. So we I wanted to write a really special tribute. Yeah, and that's the him. So uh, yeah, I mean, what what better tribute could a man have than his son back titties? <laughs> Listen, I have said that before, and I've tried to say it to my sons, but without saying it because you know, hey, listen. I want to go do this this weekend and mom wants to put up the Christmas decorations. So we compromised and we're going to put up the Christmas decorations, you know? <laughs> and my thing is, is what you really want to say is I say to my buddy, she who controls the breast makes the decisions. That's, and if my wife yeah. wants to, you know, if there's a football game on and she wants to go to a flower show, guess where we're going? Because I, yeah. Yeah. Oh, if I, if, if I had him, I'd be single. <laughs> And I probably wouldn't leave the house much. <laughs> my, I, as I sat back and said, I would never tell myself no. She, she tried to talk to me a couple of weeks ago. She said, we're home and we're doing stuff. And she walked out of the shower and she's talking to me. And I'm just like, and she goes, are you listening to me? I said, we've been married a long time. But here's the truth. When you're naked, I'm not listening to anything you're saying. I'm not. Right. And, and yeah, my God, you've seen my, we've uh, had two children. I don't care. I don't care. Yours is the only naked matter. body that I get to legally see and feel and feel good in the eyes of God. Yeah. It doesn't cost you a, subscri a yeah. subscription. So I'm all in. I'm all in. When you're when you're naked, you need to know that's where my head is, and it will be there. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Be careful with that. <laughs> all right, my friend. Thank you. Thank you so much. You are the best. I can't wait till we do it again. You got it, buddy.